Short version, go to Shout Factory TV and watch Kamen Rider Kuga or Chojun Sentai Jetman. Alternatively, look up Ultraman g on Crunchyroll, all of them legally and for free with ads on Crunchyroll. I haven't seen Kuga, but it's one of the few Rider shows available in English, while the other two I've seen and like a lot. The three in general are legally available series from the big three televised toku franchises, each from different decades. So watching them gets a foot in the door in a couple ways. Long version? Well, here we go. So, tokusatsu, shortened to toku, is a word meaning special effects, largely used to refer to live-action television series or films with heavy use of practical or digital effects alike. In the same way the word anime is used in Japan to refer to animation as a whole, foreign productions have been considered toku in the same way, which allows me to draw some strokes regarding what kind of things you might find. Where America had Star Trek as an episodic series that featured aliens in an interstellar society, Japan had Ultra 7 defending the Earth from one alien threat after another. Thunderbirds has an organized team piloting vehicles to rescue people, albeit with puppetry, where QQ Sentai GoGo 5 has that same trope, centering its story with a wholly different set of effects work and production. And if you were to take a look at chosen hunters and monsters in a contemporary urban setting, there is Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Garo. While there are some basic genre similarities and a heavy use of special effects in all these examples, I still wouldn't call the Western examples tokusatsu at least not as the term is used in Western circles. Doing such would muddy the waters arbitrarily, as how Western fans use the term is more specific, referring to Japanese-inspired works that tend to include suit actors and or a focus on martial arts, action, or superheroes. While most of Toku is Japanese and one can't ignore the Western influence on it, understandably less familiar to Western viewers is the original Japanese influence. From my rudimentary understanding, one of the most important things to consider when looking into the influences to modern Japanese visual media is kabuki theater. The hyper-exaggerated acting can be seen in voice performances or plenty of character acting or animation in general. The vibrantly colored hair might remind you of rainbow-colored casts. The powerful body movements, used to make characterization clear even at the distance of the stage, is all too familiar when it comes to tokusatsu suit acting. Moving on from that series of quick and blatant examples, we get to the last 70 or so years, where you have to consider film, professional wrestling, and manga and anime alongside tokusatsu, not just influencing as one to another, but back and forth, the media boom reaching throughout the whole country and the world. Even putting aside that I think tokusatsu has good, interesting stories worth watching, as someone who primarily covers anime manga and speaks to anime fans, I think what the community as a whole has to gain from better knowing, understanding, and appreciating tokusatsu is a better understanding of anime, manga, and other connected properties. Because while toku has seen its influences from anime, be it visual, or two of its biggest franchises ultimately being created in no small part due to manga author Shotaro Ishinomori, tokusatsu references and influences in other media can easily be missed or ignored by these communities at large were to the primary audience, they would have been instantly and easily recognizable. <laughs> to start with my favorite example, I want to bring up something a bit more diverse from anime in Pokemon. Pokemon was inspired by Satoshi Tajiri's childhood, and since I imagine he didn't deal with organized crime, instead let's take a look at a major franchise he likely would have been engaged with, especially one with a clear affinity for bugs. Team Rocket grunts have a clear design influence from some of the Shocker goons in the original Kamen Rider, but in perhaps one of my favorite references of all time, there's the intrinsic type rules of Pokemon themselves. Dark types are sneaky, conniving, and dishonorable, something evoked in their weaknesses. While Dark has moves like beat up or bite, they are ultimately weak to the raw martial arts of fighting type, their trickery unable to stand up to practice form. Fairy types are pure, but bug types are a little more abstract, representing the heroes of justice who always stand against evil. This fundamental typing interaction that has remained in the franchise for 20 years being derived as a shout out to Kamen Rider. And that's just scratching the surface. With a lot of toku shows being superhero sci-fi, action, mecha, or magical girls, genres you'll find in anime and manga, people who enjoy one are likely to enjoy others, especially those who love these things enough to enter the industry. In case you were wondering why the Sailor Moon live action toku series is even a thing, well, it's not that unusual as one of the influences to the original manga is cited as Masked Bell Poutrine that Toku leaving its fingerprints on Sailor Moon, the international popularity of which in turn left its mark on Magical Girl series forever. Now, while old pro wrestling, much like Kabuki Theater, is a whole point of influence to anime and manga that I have no idea how to begin to get into due to its relative distance, both Toku and wrestling were major factors in the hit series Kanikuman. While it's more commonly known for its wrestling action, 
The series found its beginnings as an Ultraman parody, before going on to introduce tournaments, power levels, transformations, and other important shonen tropes that many in the western sphere would come to attribute to Dragon Ball instead. And for one of the series most commonly overstated for its influence, Evangelion is a massive pastiche of older mecha, especially their characters, sci-fi series, and tokusatsu. Hideki Anno keeps no secrets when it comes to his love of Godzilla, Kamen Rider, or in particular, Ultraman. In an interview, when asked what he might do with Ultraman if he'd gotten his hands on it, claimed that he would put a lot more focus on the military the series Ultra ends up working with. And Evangelion, in a very broad sense, is that. The core episodic structure being one of fighting alien threats with lanky organic giants in government command. Never mind even more direct references. Another big one actually lies in something referencing back to comments the staff behind the show made regarding the Christian imagery. Kazuya Tsurumaki, assistant director, explained that much of the symbolism was there because it looked cool. Ano himself admitted a personal lack of familiarity with Christianity. While that doesn't detract from readings into the symbolism, a series where Christian symbols were used in ways that might influence what they found interesting or cool was, you guessed it, Ultraman. Eiji Tsuburaya was Catholic, so in creating a series about saviors of humanity, when they were captured by those who sought to harm them, well, they'd be crucified. That imagery would go on to influence a bunch of works, so if you see any weird toku crucifixions, Look to Tsuburaya and Ultraman, with Anno being one of the many creators inspired. Anno is far from alone. Nods to those stories the creators of those otaku media likely engaged with deeply during their childhoods are going to be abound wherever you look. The popularity of toku with young audiences creating a shared experience, especially among otaku and those who make stories with children and teens in mind. Picking up on references can be fun in a way, but part of where I come from in my desire to push anime fans to at least give toku more of a look is my part in a series of rather large group failings of the anime community to know and understand the cultural sphere of the media they continue to enjoy and engage with. Even more glaring than the recent SSSS, this reminds me of Evangelion, Gridman, you know, that show in part produced by Subaraya, created Ultraman and influenced Evangelion while also creating Gridman a couple years before Ava was even a thing, which in turn led to SSSS Gridman that basically serves as a 12 episode love letter Subaraya Productions. Productions. But no, the failing of the anime community to recognize Tokusatsu when it was due was back in 2013, when a little series called Samurai Flamenco rolled around. From an outsider perspective, Samurai Flamenco is weird changing setting every few episodes and going from a guy wanting to become a superhero in real life to sitting down and having a conversation with God. Though not before taking down a choppy chimp, piloting a giant mecha, and beating up the Prime Minister. Watching it as it aired was some of the weirdest and wildest shit I'd ever seen, and I don't think I'll ever quite get an experience like watching Episode 7 for the first time ever again. But looking back, yeah, a lot of that weirdness is also a giant series of tokusatsu references. Kamen Rider fights a villain group alongside Sailor Moon before coming part of a Super Sentai Squadron, then he fights Prime Minister Ogma before sitting down with an ultra-franchise alien. Yeah, it's a big love letter to Toku. Watching Samurai Flamenco with no context or background to what it looks to for inspiration is how I imagine it would be to watch Lucky Star or Pony Pony Dash if your knowledge of animation extends to Disney movies and your knowledge of Japan extends to Karate Kid. So with all that said, I do recognize that not everyone is going to care about the relative importance of Dokusatsu. So from here I want to shift gears to some of the more broadly appealing factors before discussing where to start watching something more specific than the series I mentioned in the opener of this video. One thing I've already highlighted is that, in a sense, especially with modern series, it's akin to a kind of live action anime. One point of both interest and a potential off-putter is length. While shorter shows certainly exist, the common one will be about 50 episodes each, beginning to end. Most of this time it will be a complete story, even when it comes to full franchises. As they're meant to be accessible to children, their iterative nature allows you to more or less jump in and catch up to the newest thing, while also having a large backlog to pick through at your leisure. At no point during the 51 episodes of Lupin Ranger vs. Pat Ranger or its film did I ever need context into any other entry in the 40 year old franchise. And this holds true for well over 90% of series. It's both open and easy to jump into while also having a kind of length weight, and intertextuality that I personally tend to love about long works and franchises. However, if there is one thing that I think particularly stands out when it comes to Toku, it's how that focus on visual effects lends itself to a collection of works that manage to be continually surprising visually. The first Toku show I saw after Power Rangers was Lupin Ranger vs. Pat Ranger, which was also the first time I'd seen drones used in action shots, and whatever this is. The forward-thinking mindset when it comes to visuals can be seen as a weakness, but even when effects fail, I can't help but look more towards the strengths. Mega Ranger CG looks awfully dated these days, but the show aired in 1997. The series itself has a focus on the digital, the emerging era of computers surrounding young characters and a narrative about their growth. 
So even if one can argue that it didn't age well in the effects department, how many shows of the time were using digital effects so heavily and so fittingly to the motifs the show surrounded itself in? Garou is incredibly ambitious with its CG while also being able to go full surrealist with its visual style. And perhaps the most interesting to me is Tsuburaya Pro in general. Growing up on Power Rangers, I was used to similar looking sets and low contact action sequences. So when Ultraman got on the ground and started wrestling a kaiju, needless to say, I was seeing something I never had before. So many of these unique sets would get burned to the ground, the costliness of the franchise's production having caused financial issues for the company, and even outside of the improved use of sets and props compared to the original Ultraman, Ultra 7 is of particular note visually. Several shots and scenes still sticking in my mind for their creativity. Impressive on its own merits, let alone for a show that is over 50 years old. Given the fact that one of the first pieces of media I ever fell in love with was Power Rangers, a very loose adaption of Super Sentai, discovering Super Sentai a couple years ago has at once been familiar and fresh, as I'm reminded of something I dearly loved while finding something new to enjoy and appreciate with every series I watch. And that's just what I enjoy personally. There's plenty else to enjoy that just isn't in the realm of what I tend to look for. Like anime fans might collect figures, tokusatsu has toys. Beyond even voice actor craze is suit actors. Fans compelled by those who do stunt work and manage to get across such clear movements and characterization even in heavily obscuring costumes. And never mind the aesthetic appreciation that comes from costume design, be it suit, monster, or mech. There are more ways to enjoy toku than I could really explain. So hoping I've piqued your interest in giving one of these series a shot, let's go a little bit more into where to start. Now. To give a disclaimer, when it comes to acquisition, I'm just going to say do your best. Shop Factory TV has over 700 episodes from a dozen series for free, region permitting, and legal options are increasing by the day. But much like anime in the mid-2000s, before Crunchyroll went legal, fan communities have been drawing attention to the shows they like for way longer. While I'm going to suggest you use the legal option when possible, I'm far from perfect. And inevitably, I'm going to mention things with no official release. I'm just going to ask you to do what you can, especially with ones you come to like. While I won't tell you where to watch, I can at least point you to Tokusub's wiki, which compiles all the non-English toku being subtitled, even calling attention to official releases. However, that's still going to leave you stumbling blind about anything about the individual shows themselves. And I think there's an appeal to that too, so I created a randomized toku picker for your use. Use a random number generator and roll away, giving whatever series you land on a shot. Listed as every fully subtitled series as of now, divided by franchise. Ultraman, Super Sentai, Kamen Rider, Goro, Metal Heroes, and ones outside of those, including western stuff like Power Rangers. I've also aimed to clearly label sequels with their prequel series and anniversary shows to the best of my knowledge. For the anniversary shows, you can use the list of prerequisites below as a checklist before going into them. Watching without context is going to risk spoiling you on multiple series and likely lack the punch that having emotional investment in recurring characters, imagery, or ideas would have. So I wouldn't recommend it, but at the same time, by getting a little taste of a bunch of series then you might have an inclination to try some of them afterwards, though that's not for me. Gokaiju has full-on tribute episodes to over 20 previous series, some of which serve as epilogues or otherwise address them. Mebius has less on the spoiler front, but is especially helped by having the context of the Showa era series it refers back to. Decade and Zeo heavily spoil the series they refer back to, and to my understanding are more divisive in the first place, so tread cautiously. You could also go by recognition, maybe watch something that has a cool suit or a mech design, or listen to a bunch of opening themes and take note of anything you wouldn't mind hearing a few dozen more times. But while experimentation is fine, what's going to be discussed the most is the recent and ongoing series. So in order to take part in the community, the easiest way is checking out something recent. At the time of this upload, Kamen Rider Saber will be starting or have recently started, with Zero One freshly concluded, and Garo vs. Road has no connection to the rest of the franchise, with a different main character and even setting conceit entirely, while also being a short watch. From what I've seen though, I can recommend Ultraman Z in particular for its main human ultra pair, though watching Orb and G first for context into certain returning characters might help. And my favorite of the two ongoing toku I've seen at the time of this writing is Mashin Sentai Kira Major which draws on Magical Girl series of all things to deliver a fun cast and interesting conflicts. Drew being a standout character and very good boy in an already enjoyable cast, even in just the first half of the show. But beyond that, I don't want you to be too blind going in. While random watching can be enjoyable in the lack of control, teaching someone to fish by handing them a fishing rod and stealing their eyes maybe isn't the best way to go about things. So let's go franchise by franchise to help narrow things down. Super Sentai is the most easily recognizable. What you'll tend to find here is more child friendly, but as someone who personally likes ensemble casts and doesn't mind episodic storytelling, I definitely have an inclination towards Super Sentai. 
To suggest some soft recommendations, there's Lupin Ranger vs. Pat Ranger, my favorite Toku to date, and Jetman, which I've already mentioned. The two of which I think do interesting things with the franchise's core theme of unity, the two series having main cast members more at odds with each other than usual. But to give one of my two hard recommendations for the video, that I think is a must try for someone considering getting into Toku, I'm going to suggest Resha Sentai Tokuger. A lot of tokusatsu are made with children in mind, and I think Tokuger more so than any I've seen readily accepts and revels in this fact. The characters are childish, literally using the power of their imagination to fight against the forces of darkness. There's a lot of cleverness in its construction. For example, a more wizard viewer might note that no one ever attacks in the transformation sequences, until they do, but Tokuger avoids this entirely with its white line, mixing the train motif into its transformation sequence in a way that avoids this stylistic concession. The combined finisher, and even a later power-up, are similar to the changeability of the suits in that the mod ability allows for characters the episode focuses on to get the spotlight. Red Rangers getting a lot of focus or more power-ups isn't unusual, but the cannon being able to load any of the five main Rangers bullets gives them a role in defeating the episodic bad guy and retains a focus that might otherwise be lost when the team combines their weapons. And those are just a couple examples in a show that also happens to have a fun opening and one of my favorite antagonists I've seen in the franchise yet, along with a strong aesthetic for the monsters and overall good conflict. Tokuger knows exactly what it is and accepts it unfalteringly, leaving so much to appreciate in its creative and fun framework. As such, I think it's a great encapsulation of not just Super Sentai, but Toku as a whole. In one scene early on, the conductor needs both of his hands so he removes his assistant ticket, who lies there motionlessly while he gets the job done. And this is after unflinchingly committing to his performance earlier. Then he puts him back on in front of one of the other rangers he'd been trying to convince otherwise, the one most doubtful as it was. And that's it. It never comes up again. Yeah, as a member of the audience you know it's not real. Sometimes you can see the scenes little failures and effects. But the point isn't to nitpick and point out that it's not real, because everyone already knows. It's to roll with the suspension of disbelief and accept it through the wonder of IMAGINATION! And I really love that ability to be self-aware without being condescending or mocking about it. Tokyuja is wholesome, please watch it. Kamen Rider, while less known and recognized than Power Rangers, seems to be the most widely well regarded in the Toku fanbase, and while it's my least watch of the big three through happenstance, I can definitely see why it's well liked. While still intended for kids, on average it's a little darker compared to Sentai. That's not a hard and fast rule. Kamen Rider has its less serious series like Deno or X-Aid, Super Sentai has darker ones like Jetman. But to get at the specific appeal, I do wonder if a part of why people like it is in familiarity. While Super Sentai and Ultraman, among others, are also superhero focused, Rider series commonly, if not universally, give its main Rider powers deriving from the same source as those they fight against. The main character of the first series haven't been experimented on by the antagonists before using the power he was given to fight against them. In playing heroes against villains who use similar powers, it gets at a core of superheroes you can also see in many western works, where heroes and their archenemies use similar powers to one another to drive home the importance of personal agency and responsibility. How that one uses what they have is more important than what they have or where it came from, while also having a focus on surmounting one's circumstances. And in this, Kamen Rider is core and recognizable even relative to Western superheroes despite a lack of similarity in many other ways. As far as recommendations, while I've heard good things about Kuga, Gaim, O's, and Drive, Forze in particular leans very hard into a familiar anime aesthetic with the focus on high school, making it a series I've heard good things about that also has a familiar setting to those coming from anime and manga. Build is the only one I can recommend that I've watched in full, and I think the structure, with how episodes lead into others, make it highly bingeable. Ultraman, as I mentioned before, stands out to me in its visual department in particular. If you liked SSSS Gridman, and already watched Gridman, or want to give an Ultra series a try, I'd suggest either Ultraman Jeed or Ultraman Tiga. Jeed is a series where Ultraman finally clicked for me thanks to its cast I adored, great conflict, and the strong visuals I know the series for. But what stuck out to me from the get-go is that it starts in the middle of an ongoing conflict that calls on the scope and weight of the 50-year-old franchise. Generally speaking, Ultraman has more continuity and recurring characters compared to Sentai or Rider, and Jeed was the first series I watched that really touched on that aspect for me. However, between its civilian main characters and continuous story with recurring antagonists, along with literally starting in the middle of a story that began in the Zero film trilogy, that you should watch first, by the way, while it calls on much of the franchise, I don't think it's the best representation of what it's normally like to watch, especially the earlier series, which is where I point to Ultraman Tiga. 
with the main cast being part of a group that defends Earth, the main character hiding his abilities to turn into a massive warrior of light as he helps to fight against paranormal threats and difficulties in episodic encounters. Tiga has the more familiar Ultraman structure with a fine cast of characters and has a little more of an ongoing narrative than those earlier series, especially in the last stretch. And it's not to dismiss the episodic encounters. If you enjoy the cast and seeing the variety of situations they go through to explore them will not only build feelings on them, but also show off just how much variety there can be in an otherwise rigid structure. I've seen the characters of Ultra Series deal in ethical issues regarding an alien space station on a collision course with Earth, rage against those in power covering up a tragedy wrought by their own hands, slip onto an Earth-like planet where humanity is ruled by machines who treat humans like cattle and bemoan them as a dwindling resource, or time travel to the past to deal with a monster collector interested in Tsuburaya Pro's monsters. Though episodes can end on a cynical or sour message, ultimately the Ultra still protects Earth's light of hope as a hero. Garou is a little outside of the superhero bubble, the first season having more of a horror vibe, the focus more on monster slaying. Being a bit more sexually charged at times, it definitely leans into a more teenage audience, but whether you enjoy or feel the need to look past that, the core narrative of trying to protect lights in the darkness that wants to prey on that light with some slick action sequences makes it an easy offer. It's also the most recent and shortest of the big franchises, taking less than 150 episodes of watching to catch up due to the shorter seasons and the series only starting in 2005. The list in the description also has two watch orders, one that approximates based on main character to give the continual storylines, my understanding being that the only references between the two are minor. But since I haven't seen most of these and could easily be wrong, I included the production order so you can watch it as the franchise was released. There's also a disconnected series of anime seasons I also know nothing about that are worth considering, but the one thing I can suggest with certainty is to watch the first Garou season, which has a lot that I tend to like alongside the aforementioned strong visual style and cool action. After those big franchises is Metal Heroes, the least connected. The Space Sheriff Order is the only one to note, where everything else can just be watched, but having not seen much of anything myself, I can't give any real recommendations. And beyond that, it's from my understanding the least watched and least discussed of the tokusatsu grouping, along with many of the scattered series outside of the big franchises. Going into these, I'd recommend either asking someone who might know of good ones or just jump in somewhere with an open mind. My hopes with the randomizer being that people might try one of these less talked about shows and maybe find something beyond their expectations. I can, however, recommend one series in particular. If looking to the aforementioned franchises and seeing iterations on the same concept in long 50 episode packages seems exhausting, Chibi 15 is only 12 episodes and one of the most out there and interesting toku I've seen, serving as my second hard recommendation. If Tokyuger captures the core of what toku is for its primary audiences expressed in a package anyone can understand, then Shibuya 15 is a surreal look at what can be on those fringes. When the main character wakes up in the titular city, having to find out who they are and why they are there, the story goes through a gripping mystery of youths trapped in a realm of authority under the guise of freedom, coming to question the very nature of the world they're in. Visually, it has notable direction, sets, and costume design, the character interactions are good, and the overall conflict interesting and compelling. It might seem weird at times, especially the ending, or peace, but when bringing up the potentials of what Toku can be, Shibuya 15 has given me something I can't quite say I've seen elsewhere. And maybe one day I'll be so bitter and jaded I won't be able to enjoy the typical anymore. But as a relative newcomer jumping in, the wonder and possibility seems as endless as my backlog. Speaking of which, if you're like me and enjoy obsessively cataloging what you've watched, then add me on my drama list. And if you like this video, stick around. I generally like to do thematic analysis, and in the coming month, I'm going to try and drop a lot of the toku content I've been burning to do. Should be a 15, Lupin Ranger vs. Pat Ranger, Jeed, Die Ranger, maybe more, maybe less. If you want to see something further now, then consider my Jetman video. If you're scratching your head over the lack of Kamen Rider, then give What the What's Kamen Rider Build video a look. And if he doesn't have a 0-1 video out yet, then look forward to that. And I do thank my patrons who should definitely check out their giving limits if they don't care for toku. Yes, you heard me, Farbu. Mr. Cynical, thanks Nitro Rad, Bro Rike, Offline But Not, Bayonort, Mohammed Akim, Maz, Tengun, Alvermort, and Glugol. Thank you for sticking around.